Okay, why don't we get started? So the last talk is going to be Jonathan Oppenheim. Um, is it dark matter, or is space-time undergoing a random walk? <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> Thanks all for inviting me. Um, maybe before I start, I, I, so I was going to give a, a, a whiteboard talk just so that people can ask questions and that maybe I can adapt it to where people are at. Just to give a sense, how I was interested in like how many people are more computer science-y and how many people have physics. physics -y, gravity. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Um, a bit, bit confused, I think, in the middle. Yeah. And how many people like think in terms of master equations versus path integrals? So master equations, path integrals, perfectly even. <laughs> okay, it'll be challenging. So I guess the, the main thing is then just to ask lots of questions like throughout and don't even bother to put up your hand, just ask because I'll explain badly to encourage questions. <laughs> okay. okay, so it's joint work with uh, Andrea Rousseau. Um, I'm gonna like mention a factoid for, the, for um, uh, more computer science -y people, which is that um, like in the mid 80s, uh, so there's this uh, thing called the galactic rotation curve, which is that you look at the stars far from the galactic center, you have the galactic center, and then far from the galactic center, you find that um, galactic rotation curves, when you plot them with velocity, become flat. And in the mid 80s, um, Milgram um, observed uh, the following, that if you had a theory which could modify gravity at low acceleration, then you could um, predict the, uh, the flatness of the rotation curve. And the modification that you would require of your theory of gravity is that um, at high accelerations, so if A is very large, then it should go like the Newtonian acceleration for, um, I'll call this A. And then, and then at low acceleration, it should go like the square root of A zero, A not for some, for some when A is much less than minimal acceleration, which is now called the Mond acceleration. So if you're, if you're a, I think if you're a computer scientist or like a, someone who, who looks at stochastic processes, you kind of immediately think, um, okay, like this is like the mean that goes like N and this is like the square root, like a variance. So it kind of is evocative of that and um, is some maybe intuition about what I'm gonna, uh, where I'm gonna go. Maybe some wrong intuition, but uh, uh, I think it gives a sense. By consistent with Newton's. I mean, you're modifying it, so you're saying that. At the gravitational force is, is given by a different Yeah, it's, it, it so the gravitational force changes. It's, it's like the Newtonian force at high acceleration and at low acceleration, it switches over. Um, and becomes like a square root. And it's very difficult to modify. And so, okay, it, it could be dark matter, and, and it should be mentioned there's lots of other evidence for dark matter besides these galactic rotation curves. Um, but it's, I think it's intriguing, and, and, and the, the mechanism I'm gonna suggest is a way to modify theories at low acceleration or low energy, which is very difficult to do. Um, uh, it's easier to modify theories at high, uh, high energy. Yes? I guess exactly on the same page. How much is A naught? Uh, 10 to the minus 10 uh, okay. meters per second squared. So I guess we are at Very small, so we're not going to see anything on Earth. You need to go very far from your galaxy to. Well, it's not consistent with this thinking of gravity as the curvature of space time, right? And going back to this Newtonian idea of it as a force. Yeah, I, I, so I'm not going to present anything that is a Mond theory. I'm just saying if your theory predicts some phenomenology like this, then it can at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yes. I t completely agree. Yeah. And he doesn't want to do attack an easy problem. <laughs> I guess you're doing this for a different reason, right? You're not yeah. Uh, yeah. So the, the motivation comes from, okay, so let's start from the beginning. The motivation for this comes from reconciling quantum theory with, with uh, gravity. Um, and, um, and so I will, I will discuss that. So I'll discuss this like formalism to like 
consistently couple classical systems with quantum systems. You can be interested in this whether or not you're interested in gravity. You might be interested in it because you want to model you know, um, coherent control or experimentalists making measurements or something else, or just as an interesting foundational issue, I have these two frameworks. Can I couple them? That seems like an important thing to be able to, to know the answer to. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll discuss uh, a way, that, so this formalism has something called a decoherence versus diffusion trade-off, which is both a blessing because we can use experiments to rule out the theory and a curse because we can use experiments to rule out <laughs> the theory. Um, and then I will go away from the classical quantum um, part of it and I will just take the classical limit and you'll see that, so what you require in order to make this theory consistent, if you want to couple classical systems with quantum systems, what you require to make the, th the theory consistent is um, that there is some stochasticity, some randomness in the classical system. So that it can only be consistent if there's a, lo a lot of randomness, hopefully not too much randomness. Um, and, um, and so you can, uh, we'll show that if you have randomness, you get a kind of Brownian motion force. I don't even know what to call it. I was hoping because Charlie's in the audience, he would find a name for this thing. It's not quite an entropic force, but it's a bit like an entropic force. It's just sort of like the birds of the Higgs boson. If it's moving very slowly, it has more, uh, more Well, no, but we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> okay. Can you say again what kind of system I should have in mind? Um, so I'm going to talk initially just about a stern gerlach the spin, a quantum si system. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, so the spin is the thing that's accelerating. Oh, let's, let, let's first just talk about coupling. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's talk about cl coupling classical systems with quantum systems. And then after we're done that, I'll get to the entropic force and how it might suge be suggestive <coughs> of, of dark matter. I'll just maybe say that, that part of the motivation for me at least comes um, because I think it's like if you're going to take the, uh, you know, with, uh, if you're going to treat the fact that gravity is a uh, space, uh, you know, is, our, is a geometric theory and that space time plays a very special role in quantum field theory in terms of its causal, st giving you causal structure, I think it's reasonable to question whether we should be quantizing it. So um, that is kind of the motivation or part of a big part of the motivation. Also, you know, you can have it as an effective theory or because uh, we are almost always only dealing with situations where space-time is effectively classical. So you can have it as an effective theory, like in a black hole evaporation or during inflation. Um, and also as a toy model to, you know, understand our other theories if you, if you believe in quantum gravity. Um, so there's some good things and there's some I, I, I bad or challenges, I like to call them, uh, w with this approach. So one is that it's math mathematically consistent. Um, another is that you find it's renormalizable, which is, is quite exciting for me at least, um, because th originally the whole problem with quantum gravity is that the theory is not renormalizable. So this is um, at least the pure gravity part. Um, you don't need, so it doesn't have tachyons or ghosts, nice. Um, uh, you don't need to introduce the measurement postulate, also nice. Um, maybe it, 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 it uh, is a replacement for dark matter, um, and it's experimentally testable, and you can use this trade-off that I'm going to talk about to suggest experiments. Um, some of the challenges is, as people know, there's this um, tension between locality and heating, uh, which you worry about. Um, I know in string theory, people are not too concerned about breaking locality, so they're probably not worried about this, um, <coughs> but I, I am. Um, and that was a joke that didn't go over. <laughs> I say too quickly, it's just not funny. A sore point. <laughs> okay. We, um, okay. Um, and if, if you throw in matter, it's pr it doesn't seem to be power counting renormalizable. So <laughs> those are the kind of, I think, the big challenges. Okay. So what do you mean by heating versus locality? Or will you get to that later? Um, we might get to that, yeah. So it's just this tension that goes back to Banks, Peshkin, and Suskin, who, um, in, who noticed for Limbladians that if your theory is very local, then it can result in a heating. Um, this is not, uh, this theory is, is different, but it has that worry associated with it, which I think is a legitimate worry and is the thing I think you want, you know, will keep you up at night. Okay. Jonathan, could I 
push slightly on this saying it's renormalizable. It's renormalizable when you set Newton's constant to zero, right? But quantum gravity is renormalizable if you set Newton's constant to zero. It's just a free theory. Like, you, you, in your theory, the Newton's constant... I mean, there's no matter. So there's no matter. So, so the reason gravity is non-renormalizable is because you have something with units of length squared, yes. right? You have a coupling of that. You still have a coupling of that. You're just saying if you set that coupling to zero so you don't turn on matter, then, then, uh, you, know, then, then you don't have it, so it's renormalizable. But you still have the same problem in quantum gravity if you have some coupling that has units of length squared and you can't renormalize that. It's still there the moment you have matter, so the moment you have anything quantum mechanical. Like you've not really saved us from anything, right? There's nothing well, I think in the suddenly I working here that wasn't working. I think if you look, okay, this is maybe a, a more technical discussion, but I think if you, say, compare it to pure gravity where you just have an R term in your action, which is not renormalizable, or you compare it to quadratic gravity, which is renormalizable but has ghosts, this is nice in that it doesn't right, that's have... because it's having something quantum. And you're not having anything quantum right now. Right, but, whether, but you, it still could not be... Uh, it, I mean, just because it's not quantum doesn't mean you have to w don't have to worry about renormalizability. So it could have been not renormalizable, but it is. I don't want to derail the whole conversation, so I don't want to... Yeah. I'm here until Monday, <laughs> and I'm actually desperate to talk about this. I corner people, like, regularly, like... Poor Adam, and when he's <laughs> so I'm desperate to talk about this. So if anybody wants to talk about this, I'd be happy to. Um, <laughs> and I, I won't corner you too much. Um, okay, good. So let me, let's just discuss the formalism and we'll do it like really simply, like a spin, okay? So we'll have, and, and, and a particle, um, a free particle, well not quite free particle. So we have phase space, so we have some Q and some P for phase space. Or, or you, if you don't like phase space because you're a computer scientist, we have some Z. <laughs> the classical degree of freedom. Um, and then we have a spin, say, in this case. So we have a two-level system. And we want to know, can we have a, an interaction between these two systems? And that seems like a reasonable foundational question. Of course, we can always control the qubit using the classical degrees of freedom, that's what we do when we go to the lab and we turn on and, and off our knobs. No one here has been in the lab, probably. No, I have. Okay. Oh, okay, sorry. Not very often. Sorry, sorry. Dan Carney is actually doing gravity, the, the experiments that, you know, uh, the entanglement experiments here in Berkeley. Uh, if people are interested in these experiments to test the quantum nature of gravity, he can do that. Um, okay. So we want to uh, consistently couple a quantum system and a classical system. So we have a Q and a P, and then we can uh, represent the quantum state by, a pure, well, it's a pure state, but we can also think of it as, um, we can think of it as a um, phase space density, a density of like a probability distribution over the classical degree of freedom. So some P of Z, the probability that we're at a particular point in phase space in a, a classical degree of freedom. Or, you know, if it's a continuous system, we have some um, probability density that we're at a particular point in phase space. And then given that we're at that point in phase space, we have a, a quantum state. If we, uh, maybe for people that are pure quantum people, I can write it in a pure quantum formalism. So, for example, we could write down our state. A classical quantum state is equal to some sum over probability of being at a particular point Z in the classical, s for the classical system, <laughs> point Z. and given that you're at that point Z, you have a, a, a density matrix. But so Z here could be like an embedding into a quantum system. So here's a quantum system, which I'm using as my classical system. So I pretend this quantum system is classical, so it's diagonal, right? It has no off diagonal elements. So this is a classical quantum state. And then I, given that I have a particular value of the, ran of the, the classical degree of freedom Z, I have a particular quantum state for the qubit, the density matrix sigma. Okay, so this is how you would represent a classical quantum system using pure quantum mechanics. Is that familiar with these CQ states? What's that last factor? This is the, this is the density matrix for the qubit. So this is the density matrix for a classical system and a qubit. Written in purely quantum language, yeah. So when you're writing things, is, is Z both the Q and P? Yes. Okay. So like it, it's both Q and P. Oh, right. So if I, w yeah. So 
I, the, the reason I think that these embeddings are a little bit problematic um, is that you know, Q and P don't normally commute with each other. You know, in the classical case, uh, well, in the quantum case, they wouldn't commute. So you couldn't really uh, stick, you, couldn't, you have to embed them in a, in a quantum system in a, in a peculiar way if you're going to think of this classical system as it being embedded in a quantum system. So that's why I like to think of it just the, classes, the classical system is genuinely classical. So it's just a point in phase space. And if we're going to do that, we could actually, you know, there's a couple ways to represent it. One is that you could have, you could, you could write your state as a two by two matrix where this is a probability that's dependent on Q and P, and this is a one minus P. And then you have the coherences. So you have a, a two by two density matrix, but the matrix elements depend on phase space. So that's another way of thinking about it. Or I can, uh, or I can, another way of thinking about it is Some probability distribution over Q and P, and then some points in the matrix. I guess that fits into it. Any questions about how we represent classical quantum systems? The main thing about it is that there cannot be any entanglement between the classical system and the quantum system. We can now ask what the most general dynamics is for on, this, on these uh, CQ or classical quantum systems. Um, and we want, the, uh, so we want that it preserves the state space, right? So it should map a state to a classical quantum state to another classical quantum state. And uh, is a funny one. Hello, hello. Um, one thing about this, th this state is that it's normalized, right? It has to be normalized and it's positive because <coughs> it's representing probability distribution. So, for every Q and P, this density matrix has to be positive. And so we have that uh, this density matrix is positive, and also that the, the normalization condition, which is a trace of rho integrating over dQ dP, has to equal one. Okay, so it's normalized and it's positive. So that's the two properties of the thing. And now I can just ask what's the most general form of the dynamics that is completely positive and norm preserving? just like we do for the Lindblad equation or for the Fokker-Planck equation. Questions? Um, I'm going to do it by example. Um, I'm going to give, uh, we're go uh, the stern gerlach is the easiest example, I think. So we have a Hamiltonian, um, which has got three particles, so p squared over 2m, Can I say Hamiltonian in the auditorium? <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of room today. Um, plus, um, like a classical quantum potential. So here we have, I'll call this D1, so for a coupling constant. And then I have Q, and then I have the spin sigma. So a bad notation, maybe I'll call it Z. This is like a stern gerlach If it's spin up, then the particle will go up in momentum. So here we're swapping momentum with time. And so at, uh, it'll, you know, it'll split. If, it, if it's spin up, it'll go in one direction. And if it's um, <coughs> spin down, it'll go the other direction. Okay, that's what we expect. So, we, so, so this is the Hamiltonian we're interested in, and now we can ask what's the general form of the dynamics, which will give us this sort of Hamiltonian. Um, and it has a few parts, and I'll explain each of the parts one by one. Okay. So, um, um, so we'll do it by a master equation for half the audience. So we have um, a master equation, so an evolution equation for the um, for the probability density, it's going to look like a Lindbladian part and a Fokker-Planck part. 
and then a back reaction part. So it'll have all three parts to it. So the first part is that you might have um, the purely um, classical evolution, which is, if you remember, um, uh, I'll call this H0 for the purely classical part. So the evolution law for a classical system is given by the Louisville equation. That's this equation there. It's just the Poisson bracket of the Hamiltonian with the phase space density. Then it has the purely quantum evolution, which is the Poisson bracket, right? I mean, sorry, the, um, the commutator. So we have this, and then we have purely quantum evolution, which is given by the Heisenberg equation. So is one of those a P and one of those a rho? Yeah, they're both rho. Yeah. Yeah. Just put a hat here to remind you that this has a quantum part to it, and then it also has a classical part to it. So you have the classical evolution, which is just us in our lab. We evolve classically in our lab. We just, you know, we just evolve according to the laws of classical mechanics. So that's us. Then this is what I sometimes call quantum field theory in curved space. <laughs> or it's, what, it's, it's the quantum control part, right? Because this Hamiltonian depends on the classical degree of freedom, but it's, it's the pure quantum evolution of the spin here. So the spin evolves, but this Hamiltonian can depend on Q and P, in this case in particular Q, so the evolution will, it's, it's like, it's like uh, you, you have knobs that you can turn, and so the spin is evolving, but there's some parameters in your Hamiltonian which are classical. So like in quantum field theory and curved space, the evolution is quantum, but the, there's some classical parameters in your Hamiltonian. Questions about these two parts? So this was the boring part. We always knew how to have a classical system controlling a quantum system. We always knew how to have classical evolution of that controlled degrees of freedom. And so the hard part is the back reaction I'm glad Charlie's here because I actually call it this, the Homer Simpson method for how to m write the back reaction term. So the back reaction term, you would normally, what you would do is you would write the Poisson bracket um, of the Hamiltonian, of the, of the interaction Hamiltonian here, right? Um, to the density matrix. So this is the back reaction of, so, so this, is the, this is this part of, this is the back reaction. So it either goes up or down. That's the back reaction, right? If the spin is up, the back reaction is that it forces the particle up. If the back reaction, if the spin is down, the back reaction is in another direction. And so it's given by this Poisson bracket, but you have an operator ambiguity uh, operator ordering ambiguity, like should you put the Hamiltonian because it has an operator on the left or should it go on the right? So the Homer Simpson method, you take the average of the two possibilities. So we take one half here. And so that's the back reaction. So I'll write out what it is um, in a moment. Maybe I'll do that now. You say that's the back reaction. Yeah. How much choice do you have in writing that down? Um, so if the um, if the evolution is given by a Hamiltonian and is continuous, then you have no choice. Um, but if your evolution is discrete, so there's two kinds of master equations you can derive: one which is continuous in phase space, one which is hops. Um, just like in classical stochastic dynamics, you can have the Fokker-Planck equation, which is the continuous one, then you can have a jumping master equation. Okay, so that's the back reaction part. That's the hard part. And th this, dyna this, th this dynamics is known to not be positive, so or not be completely positive. Okay, so, so how do you make it completely positive? You find that you need to add two terms. One is a decoherence term and one is a diffusion term. Um, meaning, you, so you ha have to have something which looks like this, it's a, uh, we call this D0 is the coupling to the decoherence. So you have decoherence with respect to the spin. And I'll just write it as a double Poisson bracket. Sorry, this was called Z, wasn't it? 
So I'm decohering in the Z basis. So this is the Limbladian term. Okay. I'm running as a double. Can people see this? Okay, we can go here. I'll erase the good. <laughs> I'll leave the challenges. So I'll, I'll write that in just the back. So, so the back reaction term, so di rho, di t, these, um, I'll forget the free part, um, take it red. So the back reaction term looks like this. It's one half sigma, uh, sorry, that's z, z di rho di p plus one half. So this is the back reaction term. If the spin is up, it moves it in one direction. If the spin is down, it moves it in the other direction. And if, uh, at, at least for the diagonal part. Okay, so now um, the decoherence term is going to give it what I said. Z. Z. So that's the Limbladian term, so it decoheres. And now I'll give you the diffusion term in the classical degree of freedom. And that's D0? It's it, we're calling it D0, so it's a coupling to the, oh, this had a, this had a D1, didn't it? Because I put it, yeah. the Hamiltonian had a D1 there, which I forgot. So this has a D1. So the D1 is like, the, they're labeling the moments of, um, of this master equation. So the D1 is the back reaction, the D0 is the, Limbladian and the D2 is like the diffusion. They have to do with the, mo the moments of this thing in phase space. But that's something you can choose these parameters given. We'll see that you can choose probably one of them. Uh, Jonathan, I'm hearing some muttering from the computer scientists in the audience that it would be helpful if you defined the Poisson rack. <laughs> okay. It's the classical version of the commutator. Um, and so. Um, the Poisson bracket of G and and say F is <laughs> di G di Q di F di P minus di G di P di F. I can write it without. I'm going to write it without Poisson brackets if that is. Yeah, so so I took the Poisson bracket, so I took the derivative with respect to Q, so I just have a D one Z now and di rho di P. That's why I just have that term here. So there was no because the, because the Hamiltonian, the coupling doesn't depend on P, I only have the one term. Is there a sign error? But there's the piece. <coughs> Possibly. I don't think so. But possibly. Can you find force? The force is either positive or negative. It doesn't matter. I mean, it's going to be minus here. Oh, you mean relative to this? No, this is right because. Um, there's a minus sign here, but it's on the other side, uh, and so the Poisson bracket at first acts the Q and then the P. And this is the sum of both of them. Yeah, with different signs. Okay. Let me write out the thing and then draw you a picture, and maybe that will be enough. So there's a diffusion part. I'm not going to. So I'm not going to write it as a. I could write it as a triple Poisson bracket, but I'll write it if you're unfamiliar with the uh, Poisson bracket. I'll just write it as di squared rho di p squared, okay? So it's a diffusion, it's a Fokker-Planck term. The Fokker-Planck is the most general um, 
you know, classical master equation, which is continuous. So it's the, the Fokker Planck is the, I, I think what's useful about this is it, it puts, at least in my head, it put, it matched up various things in quantum land and classical land, which I feel is important to kind of think of what is the analogous thing. So it's, you know, the Lindblad equation that we're all used to in quantum theory is analogous to the Fokker Planck equation in classical stochastic mechanics. So it's important to kind of have those two things. The commutator is analogous to the Poisson bracket, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So here we have, it's analogous to the decoherence term is the diffusion term. And this just means that the, this is like Brownian motion, the particle kind of moves about in momentum space and gets more and more. I mean, if it's not too hard, like in general, okay, so here you wrote the answer for this diffusion decoherence term. For, the, for this case, like, is there some general prescription for, like, yeah, for this classical quantum formula? So there's, the, I think you have two choices at the beginning. You can say, do I want continuous evolution in phase space or discrete? If you pick continuous, then you're much more constrained, and there's only two. Um, they're actually matrices because you could, I've given you a very simple case where there's only one degree of freedom, one spin and one, um, uh, one uh, Q and a P, but you, in, in general, this D0 and this D2 will be matrices. In but also the thing in front of D0 and D2, right? I mean, you wrote something that's very specific to this model, the Z and the D, right? I mean, right, so, in the, so, so the, the, the general equation will have this in it, and then it'll have a diffusion and a decoherence term, and you don't have much choice over those. I'm asking what are those. I'm asking what are the decoherence and diffusion terms. Here you wrote Z, right. this is specific to this model. So what is it in general? Uh, in general, it's this, uh, what is called the alexandrov gerasimov bracket, which is this Homer-Simpson bracket over here. So that's the back reaction. That's the back reaction. Then once you've chosen that, you have two more, mo you have this decoherence term. So what are those? <coughs> what are those? <laughs> Can I do the example? Of, I, I, oh, it's fine if you just uh, stick to this example. I'm just asking yeah. if it's easy to write something, what is it, like say what is it in general, but that's fine. If yeah, you I don't think you learn a lot by going to the general case. You obviously need it if you're going to apply it to gravity or anything more simple than this, but I don't think you, I don't think it's very illuminating. Sure, okay, no problem. Yeah. Um, if we have time, we can get to it. Uh, okay. So you have this decoherence term in Z, and you have this, um, diffusion term, which is this Brownian motion term. And I'm just gonna pause, I'll take questions and then I'll do a picture. Maybe I'll first do a picture. I need to raise some of the challenges. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's look at what's going to happen to the spin particle. Um, let's just look at the, the spin up and the spin down case. So here's time and here is momentum. So um, if it's spin up, it'll do this. And if it's spin down, it'll do that. That's what the back reaction says. Now, if we just have that back reaction, what's going to happen, the spin collapses instantly, right? Because, you know, at, at arbitrary close to t equals zero, we know exactly whether it's spin up or spin down. So it collapses right away. Right. So in order, so that's fine if you don't mind that. Um, but that's not what happens in light. In, or actually, it won't even be, you know, so the, the spin up will go there, the spin down will go there. But, the, you know, you have this coherence term here. And you can kind of see that the off diagonal element is kind of going to act in a strange way. The one, the bra will be pushed in one way and the ket will be pushed in another way. So it won't be positive. Um, but now you have the diffusion term. So you have this term which tells you that rather than just go up in momentum, if it's spin up, it'll actually do something like this. And if it's spin down, it'll do something like this. And so there's a period here until here where you don't know if it's spin up or spin down. There's too much noise, there's diffusion in the classical degree of freedom, and you don't know whether there's noise. So you, 
so at, at early times, you don't know whether it's spin up or spin down, but eventually you learn that it's spin up or spin down. You wait long enough, and uh, say somewhere here, you collect enough data, and you know that it's spin up. And so it better be that by that time, it's decohered. Okay. So that's the, what the decoherence term is giving you. And you need that there should be enough decoherence. So the more diffusion you have, the less decoherence you need, right? Because if you have a lot of diffusion, so there's a lot of randomness in this thing, then you, know, you, can, it, it, you can have a long coherence time and everything's okay. But if you don't have much diffusion, then your coherence time will be very short because you'll very quickly learn the value of the spin. So there's a trade-off to this thing. Two to write this nicely. The trade-off is something like d0, d2 has to be lar uh, uh, bigger than, smaller than. Okay. This first example actually comes from Diyoshi in the 90s, like mid-90s. Um, so mostly we just did is generalize it to a general Hamiltonian, to a general case. And this comes just from positivity, not This comes just from, from no, it comes from complete positivity. Oh, complete? Complete positivity. So you want that for every Q and P. Um, for every Q and P, uh, it's completely positive. Yeah. Could you say again what the effect of the decoherence term was? Sorry? What the effect of the decoherence term was? The, the D0 term? What would be the effect of it, you mean? Like what, what does it do to those curves that you drew there? Oh, okay, I'll draw it on a, let me draw it on a block sphere. Um, Let's say I start off in the plus state. Then what's going to so th there's something remark. I'll actually give the <coughs> the kind of interesting case for first, which is there's something remarkable which happens if you saturate the trade-off. So if d d zero d two is equal to d one, then the quantum state throughout the evolution stays pure the whole time. So you don't use any. There's no decoherence. Actually, it's conditioned on the classical degree of freedom, the quantum state stays pure. So there's no loss of quantum information in, these, in this theory if you saturate the trade-off. So what happens if this, is the, if this is the one and this is the zero, then um, it kind of zigzags along the block sphere and either drops here or here at the same time as this is happening. So on average, if you were to trace out the particle, you get the decoherence. It decoheres into the one and zero state. But if you keep the classical degree of freedom, it doesn't decohere at all. It stays pure, and it, and it moves along the surface of the block sphere. This was supposed to represent the surface of the block sphere. So it moves along the surface of the block sphere. You don't use any quantum information. There's no decoherence in it either goes to the zero or the one state. So you get a kind of collapse uh, of the wave function proportional to the, correct, to the Born rule. Um, yeah. um, what about the, what determines uh, um, the, the trajectory of the pure state? I am assuming something about the probability distribution of the, the classical particle that determines. This. Right, so this is, so, so what happens is the, the quantum state stays pure, but you have a breakdown in predictability. So it's like a, there's, some, there's some stochastic evolution of the, gra of the classical degree of freedom, which is going to be space-time. And so this breakdown in predictability is what you know, somehow determines whether you collapse into the zero or one. But it's, not at, it's, not, it's, not, it's, it's, it's a local thing. So it's just <coughs> happening in time. You just get these local kicks. And so this state is kind of moving along the block sphere the whole time. It, it's only when it gets there that it's kind of collapsed. But, um, so it's not like there's a single random variable that determines whether it's going to drop to spin up or spin down. It's a gradual series of random variables that slowly m move it. There's a little dance that happens between the random variables and the spin. So it's slowly moving to the up or down. Yeah. Uh, so given the Hamiltonian, which fixes D1, D0 and D2. Yeah, so, so D1. D1 is, in, some, in, in the case of gravity, it's like gizzed for you, the back reaction. You don't have any choice about that. If you want to saturate the trade-off, which 
we do because it's, uh, it turns out for the path integral, we need to saturate in order to prove it's completely positive. Um, um, and so if you saturate the trade-off, you only have one, well, it's actually a matrix of free parameters. So. But, like, but given this Hamiltonian, D0 and D2 should be fixed, right? Uh, if, if it was just a single degree of freedom, then only one of them is fixed. You saturate the trade-off, so you can pick one of them. But in a, <coughs> if you have more degrees of freedom, then you have a matrix. So yeah, but for this example, one or D0 and D2. For this example, you just can pick one of them. So we, if, we, if, we, if the trade-off is given, if this is the trade-off, then we can just write, if we wanted to, we could just pick this to be... <coughs> Zero, and we pick your D1, D and D1 were chosen to be one, so that's it. That's the theory is specified. So there's not a lot of freedom here. But where's even this freedom coming from? The, I guess it's your coherence time. So this this is how long do you want to you know you, the, the the D zero or the D two fixes for you how how long your states can stay coherent. So this is the experiment actually that we're proposing, which is that you have this trade-off. And you can do stern, you can do um, coherence time measurements of. In this case, it has to be very heavy, uh, well, gold, like the very <coughs> dense, I should say, objects. So you so you put very dense objects in superposition, and then that gives you a bound that tells you that you know t zero has to be larger than some number or less than some number, sorry, and then you can test how much stochasticity you have in the gravitational field, how much randomness you have in the gravitational field, and that puts a bound on D2, and so you could rule out the theory by measuring how much stochasticity you have in the gravitational field and how much coherence time you have for heavy molecules. So th that, that is the set of experiments we've proposed to, say, falsify the theory. Question. So in principle, you could do to the electric field what you've done to the gravitational field? Yes. That's a consistent theory, according to you, but it's experimentally ruled out. And what experiment has ruled it out? Um, so it's ruled out right away, just like the D1 and the back reaction is so big yeah. that you know you, you would need such an incredible amount of noise in order to have any coherence times at all. Also the ultraviolet catastrophe. So those two things work. So it, it's ruled out by the fact that you can do the regular non-gravitational well, yeah, just the fact that you have any coherence in for an electron rules it out right away. Because the, the electromagnetic field is so huge. Whereas the gravitational one is weaker. So at least for terrestrial experiments, you can kind of, it's still, well, so we've already ruled out what we call the, not, so you can actually use this to already rule out what we call ultra-local non-relativistic theories. Which are actually linear theories. So you can rule out a whole class of models already um, from the straight line. Ultra-local non-relativistic theories of gravity. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you can rule out a pretty wide class of models, the ones that you would most like. From the fact that you can do the gravitational... The trade-off. Right? Yeah, from the trade-off. The fact that you can put in uh, gold into big superpositions and the fact that we don't you know that we can do a Cavendish experiment. So that's enough to rule out some wide class of theories. Yes? Is this final state you've drawn on the block sphere a fixed point of the equation, or does it keep oscillating after it gets there? I think it'll be a fixed point of this thing, right? Because this thing will just go to zero. Uh, go to zero. Okay, but the, foc the, the extra, the... Yeah, yeah, this thing will keep moving around, I suppose. Which could reintroduce the second. Yeah, if, yeah if, if, if the Hamiltonian then depends on the degree of freedom. Yeah, so for the oscillator, we actually see recoherences when you do the harmonic oscillator. Okay. So you kind of decohere and then you recohere again. It's weird. It looks very quantum mechanical. It's like you wouldn't expect recoherence. I mean, it doesn't... It's collapsed, but it's a very really weird collapse because you can... <laughs> I wouldn't call it... Yeah. Can I interpret that as like a recurrent, like a Poincaré recurrence? There's like some effective size of the system. Where um, um, no, I do. yeah. If the th if the if the th if it's really big, you wouldn't expect such a thing. But yeah, it's, it's because it's just too it's classic oscillator with a quantum oscillator, yeah. so it's very easy to just you know if it's exactly that thing that you're collapsed, then you just move back here because you stochastically move back. Question. 
Okay, so I'll now do the entropic force, stochastic force. I don't know what to call it. I would appreciate suggestions. So it's so so the, the thing that you can just take from this is that there has to be diffusion in the in this case gravitational field um, or whatever uh, thing, and so that necessarily produces uh, a kind of a, a force. And just um, maybe to give a simple version of that. Uh, um, Let's imagine, well, let's first imagine that we have, we're just going to do a random walk. So we start, say, at x equals 0. And then we know that after some time, we'll be kind of spread out in some root n manner. That's not a, a force, right? Because the average of the particle's position is 0. So on average, it's not going to do anything. So I would not consider that much of a force. But now let's imagine that we. Um, have a wall, so we have a wall here, and let's say that I put a particle down close to the wall, and it's undergoing diffusion. So what's going to happen? Its mean value is going to be different. In the deterministic theory, if there was no diffusion, it would just sit here, right? It would just sit close to the wall and nothing would happen. But if it's undergoing diffusion, it'll undergo Brownian motion. It can't go into the wall, so it goes we'll find it out here, and it can push out a piston. If you put a piston there, it will push it, push it out. So it's a real kind of a force. So we do that, and it pushes it out. There's my piston. There's my heart. So where is the wall coming from? I'm just positing a wall. So if you, have, if you don't have any potential, then you don't see anything. If you have a linear potential, you won't see anything, or even a quadratic potential. But if you have something which is higher than a quadratic potential, like the wall, then it will push out. And maybe the way to kind of say what that is, um, how much time? I guess I got t uh, 10 minutes. Is that, or we have questions, so five minutes? Or so if you have something which is a force law, like f of q equals ma, and let's, say that mi let's write it as minus mq double dot, if that is satisfied on average, so this is the Newtonian force law, it's satisfied on average, then you can see right away that if f of, f of q has, say, if a q squared, so this is like q squared, then the expectation value of q squared is equal to m q double dot, and that is not equal to um, q the expectation value of q all squared. So this is kind of what it would do deterministically, but there's this there's this kind of stochastic force, which means that it no longer obeys the Newtonian force law, but it, it, it <coughs> responds to the variance. All right. So that's this kind of stochastic force. Questions about the stochastic force? Okay. Um, so if evolution should be linear in the probability distribution. I don't see how you get this. Like if we if we just start with Q having no variance, yeah. and then we have some evolution for that, it's some master equation. So if we add up a load of those things which each have no variance, then we should get the final evolution. Yes. So it seems like if you condition the, the, the evolution condition on some starting conditions and see anything like this, and then you just integrate over starting conditions. Like, it feels like something that's showing up in expectation values, but not in the dynamics condition on a particular. Well, it, I mean, it, it, no, not, I mean, you can see that it will happen, right? I mean, the wall is a good example. The, the, the mean value of this, the mean trajectory is changing. It, it's different to the deterministic if case. If it hits the wall. Sorry? Right, if I condition on the initial condition. Right. Right, and then I evolve forwards in time. Yes. Then I have some probability it hits the wall, and then yeah. of course it moves. Yes. But like, yeah, you know, the paths that don't hit the wall are unaffected by the wall. That's true, but they're the, all the ones that go to the right anyway. Yeah, but I, I, I guess I'm just like, if you condition or not hitting the wall, then nothing's changed. So that I, I don't understand why you're saying this is a statistical thing. It just seems like there's a force because maybe you hit the wall. I mean, you. you I don't think you see, you, you can, it, you only get this because of the diffusion. So I think that's what I would, I mean, it's like, you because you have, a, you, you, you have a, like a mechanical force, which is the potential. And then when you add in the diffusion, it, you get a change from the mechanical force law. It, it just 
feels like something about about expectation values to me rather than about like it's about the fact that you're taking a mean rather than like looking at the distribution and just of course the distribution is changed by the fact you have diffusion and sometimes it hits the wall and then it changes but the parts that don't hit the wall are not getting affected. Okay, but I guess I would say those are the ones that anyway end up with the thing. I mean, for, it's a physical point of view that if you it, no matter how you solve it, you find in the yeah, end okay, that the I wanna, okay. yeah. Um, I'm just trying to think if I have enough time to present the... I'll give a little bit of the punchline maybe without properly explaining it, which is that um, you can write a path integ integral for this diffusive processes. So they look something like, in the case of Brownian motion, they would look something like e to the minus 1 over d2 q double dot squared. Um, and you can see what, the, what this does for in a path integral, um, if you have some path integral over all Q, is that what it does is when the force is zero, it preferences those sorts of trajectories. But you can have stochastic fluctuations away from zero force. So, but they're suppressed by quite a bit by this. Uh, you know, and it, and kind of, uh, so, you, so you have... I guess this is a bit like a Langevin equation or a Fokker-Planck equation, which is that when the force is zero, those are the, the preferred paths. If you have fluctuations away from zero force, then those are still allowed, but they're suppressed. And so this is a path integral for Brownian motion. And notice that it has higher derivative terms, which we usually are petrified about. We would never, if we quantize this, we'll get these ghosts. And so we shouldn't quantize this. Um, but as a stochastic equation, it makes total sense, and it's all well-behaved, and there's no ghosts and no negative energies. All right? um, and so if you solve for this path integral, you can solve for the Euler-Lagrange equation, and you find that in addition to the standard force law, so instead of having, so if you, if you solve the Euler-Lagrange equation for this Brownian motion path integral, you find that you have Q of t is equal to Q of zero, so the zero plus vt, so the standard free particle plus an acceleration term, one half a naught t squared, and then another term as well, t cubed. You can put this back in the path integral. Sorry, I'm, only, I, I'm doing this in like two minutes, but it's actually it, both the gravity case and this Brownian motion case are actually fairly simple to do. It's fairly simple, so I'll just, I'm just sketching it. So you have a path integral. You can solve for the uh, extreme points of the path integral. They contain additional terms compared to the usual force law. And when you plug it back into the path integral, you can figure out the distribution over these quantities. And likewise, for gravity, what you find is you have um, e to the minus, for example, for the Newtonian force law, you have if there's no matter, you would have nabla phi squared. So this looks like Poisson's equation, but it's squared, and you are suppressing deviations from Poisson's equation. And when you solve for this, you find you have additional terms, which give you um, Mond-like behavior. Addition, you, know, you get a, a Mond-like behavior for galactic rotation curve. Um, I should also say that we have looked at the cosmology, because the, the best signatures for dark matter are to do with cosmology and the CMB spectrum, and there we also find that this stochastic fluctuations behaves like cold dark matter, at least in the early universe. So uh, we'll have that paper out next week. So thanks very much for your attention. So it's like very early days. Like all, all we can do is a, a plausibility argument, which just says here you have this uh, this extra term, which um, only enters the Friedman equations through the constraint equation and doesn't enter the dynamics. And that looks that is how cold dark matter behaves. So that's all we can say. So I think you now have to model 
you know, you have to model the, this theory and see what it says in comparison to lambda CDM. I think that's the. But it, it is a stuff. Like the stochastic fluctuation is a kind of stuff that's oh, there. So, sorry. You're saying it's some kind of matter. It, it behaves in some ways like matter. And it, I mean, it, it depends on the context. So you have to be very careful. I don't want to say anything too strong. All we like. The, the most we can say in terms of FRW is that it only enters in terms of the constraint, which is what cold dark matter does, and that's it. How it appears in the CMB spectrum, I think we need to do more calculations for that. How it evolves dynamically, I, I have no idea. Yeah. So, or like, does it lens? You, you imagine it might, but I, you know, I think what needs to check that. Yeah, so maybe just, I'm, another kind of feature that was probably not a question, but, uh, is there some concern that if like, the fundamental theory of nature is somehow stochastic and, the na and nature is very old, that uh, everything just thermalizes completely right. uh, when, when coupling to these? Yeah, so I think that's a, a danger that you find that, the, that, the, you know, that you just produce too much stochastic noise and the thing uh, you know, is kind of ruled out by that. But this is your heating problem. This is the heating problem. So it's this, this is this tension between locality and heating. So you kind of have like a, I guess in the original heating problem, you don't have the original heating problem because you can make your, where is it? You can make your decoherence as small as you want here. The problem is if you make the, if you make the decoherence small, then you have the stochastic part being big and that leads to a different kind of heating in some sense. So you kind of are caught between a bit of a rock and a hard place and the danger is that it's, all such models are ruled out. So some are already ruled out. Um, hopefully there's still some good ones. Um, this, this may be a bit of a naive question. Um, so when you say a model and you can rule it, does it, does it mean like the kind of coupling that you can have this between these classical and quantum systems? Or, um, yeah, you have some choice. You have some choice in terms of uh, the matrix of so you have, you have a big choice when you go to continuous or, or non-continuous. And then you, I guess you have some choice as to what this, this can depend on phase space. So there's ways of coupling it so that, for example, you only have diffusion where there's a non-zero matter distribution, which can help you a lot if you're worried about having diffusion everywhere. So, there, so you know, but I feel like, the, the, you know, there's... The, what I anticipate happening is that you know you might be able to rule out a bunch of really plausible models, and you're left with models that are not very plausible. That's kind of the. Uh, you know. Yeah. You said at the beginning you could use this just if you know, in the more pedestrian situation of wanting to couple a quantum and a classical system. Yes. Uh, there you could also imagine modeling the, the classical system as some classical limit of a quantum system. Yes. Right. Do you end up in the same place, or are these procedures different? Um, so I, I did this with um, a student of mine, Isaac Leighton. Uh, uh, like, what is the quantum quantum to classical quantum limit, I guess you could call it. And what we found is that this theory, there's a parameter range in which this theory does represent that limit. And the main difference, though, I would So in other words, you could. there's a difference between the effective theory and, and the fundamental theory. But the main difference is that the fundamental, th the, the effective theory, it can be non-Markovian. Which is the effective? Sorry? The effective is the classical limit. The, 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 the classical limit, yeah. If you have a quant two quantum systems and you go to a classical quantum limit, then you, you have non-Markovian, and then you have a lot more freedom. Then you can choose these, I mean, as you well know, you, you can choose these to sometimes be negative even, as long as on balance they're positive for every trajectory. Um, and, you know, we expect something very different to happen in a Ster stern gerlach experiment, for example. It'll decohere, and then it can recohere again when you bring the paths back together. So, you know, if that, you know, uh, so, for example, you know, I, I feel like that is a reasonable direction to take this in because you can compute things in GR with this in that limit and not worry so much about what you seem to would it be possible for you to write down your formula for like the Mond coefficient in terms of whatever your fundamental parameters are, like d zero and g newton? Um, so yeah, so if you solve this, uh, the Newtonian limit is kind of maybe easier. Sure. Um, 
Although it's not as, uh, you can't really relate them as easily to the cosmological constant. Um, but so if you want to solve this Euler-Lagrange equation, so, so you have that Poisson's equation is satisfied on average, so this thing is tending to zero. And so when you solve the Euler-Lagrange equation, you get this. So just like, with, it, it's almost identical to the Brownian motion, the Brownian particle, which is that you get the straight line, you get the free particle, but then you get two additional terms. So here you get, when you solve nabla to the fourth phi equals zero, instead of getting, you get the usual, when you solve for it, we call this the most probable path, you get minus gm on r on x, say. So you get the Newtonian part. And then you get a constant, and then which is the just again Newtonian. So this is the Newtonian solution. But then you get two other terms. One which is like this, which is has the units of acceleration, and one which has uh, units of a cosmological constant. So you get these two additional terms. And how are those related to what you started with? Um, so they're just a solution to the Euler-Lagrange equation. So they're just like you can, you know, the Stop equation of motion you're squared. You're claiming this comes from some Newtonian limit of something that involves d zero and g Newton. Right. So here, well, so this is just are gamma one and gamma two related to uh, g Newton and d zero. Well, here I'm just doing the vacuum equation. Uh, like we would go to Schwarzschild if we were, but like I'd actually be doing Schwarzschild, so we just do the vacuum. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to take the limit where, where like everything's weakly coupled and so it looks like Schwarzschild. I'm just asking what are gamma one and gamma two. So, okay, good. So they are just like constants which you don't know what they are. So they would normally be set by initial conditions and by boundary conditions in this case. And here they become random variables. So normally what you would do in a deterministic theory is you would say, okay, I started with some initial position and some in initial velocity, and then I'm deterministically, I can't specify anything else. Here, because it's stochastic, you have additional kinds of, they're not really degrees of freedom, but they kind of are. You have these additional parameters, and you put them in, and you find that you, know, you have a probability distribution over final conditions. It's not just one. You have a whole bunch of different final conditions because it's stochastic, like in the Brownian motion case. So you have a distribution. So you end up getting a okay, distribution over gamma yeah. one and gamma two. Let's let's start with just the metric fixed. Let's say as as right. like uh, to just be a Newtonian potential right. or something. Yes. Then then what? So gamma one and gamma two are like getting bigger with time. These are time dependent things. Like if you're matching dark matter, are you plugging in the age of the universe? Like how? I don't. Right. So I'm solving I'm solving this model where I have something like so the the path integral looks like something like e to the minus one over. Uh, two d two, and then yeah. I'm just have. You have d two and you have g new. Just d x here, and then this is we could just do nabla squared phi minus four pi g newton n. Which one to g newton. Yeah. So this thing all squared. Yeah, fine. So so you you you're going to satisfy Poisson's equation. Yeah. But okay. you're going to allow stochastic fluctuations to it, and these. So this action is zero on these terms. Yeah, so t equals zero, let's, so let's make the metric be fixed or something. Let's put some initial conditions. So we have g Newton and d2. Can we write like gamma one and gamma two as a function of time or something? Like no, no, okay, so this is like a, good. So this is like, so here, it's just Newtonian, this is the Newtonian limit. So it's just like a stationary solution, right? This is the Newtonian limit of the theory. So you don't have an integral over dt, it's just this integral over space. And so when you plug this, when you, when you write the on-shell action, you plug in the solution into this thing and you get a distribution over, um, over these random variables, so something like gamma one. So do you, but, but you must know like the mean and variance of these things. Right. Yeah, so you compute the mean and variance of those things. Okay, so can what's you say what's what those the mean are? mean and variance of them in terms of? Yeah. Well, it, it's in terms of a parameter d2, and you find that one of them looks like a cosmological constant, and one of them looks like a, gives you the mon behavior. I, I, just, I just want what the formulas are in terms of d2 and g-newton. <laughs> okay. Um, 
because uh, uh, this is partly why I was trying to read your paper and trying to understand it, and right. you had like sizes of the universe appearing in there, yes. and that really strongly confused me, right. because that shouldn't be getting involved at all if you have some local action, you should just be right. able to evolve locally, there right. shouldn't be any factors of yes. yeah. So I'm wanting to ask you. Yeah, yeah so I... So what so else I, is Gamma 1 and Gamma right. 2? Good. So, so when you write this thing, you end up getting something which has an R in it, I think it's something like this. R is, what is R? So R is the R max that you're integrating over. So if I'm in an infinite universe, then this just goes away? Um, like how is the size of the universe getting involved? We have relativity, right? right. But, but locally, the physics yeah. shouldn't know uh, the size of the universe. Sure. So, th so th I guess I, th there's, I mean, we, we note this like deficit in our thing, and then we go to a, lo a purely local model where you have a handle over the local degrees of freedom. The problem is that you're writing a spherically symmetric distribution. But when you're, when you're putting in, when you're getting a result that says you're matching dark matter and dark energy, you're yes. putting in the size of the universe right. in grams as well. Yes. Right, so, and you also have D2. Mm -hmm. So then you're fitting two parameters. You have two choices of parameters there. You and you're matching those two things. That mm -hmm. seems not very hard. Well, no, you, I mean, so, okay, so where, where can it go wrong? You can get the wrong sign. You don't have a choice I, of the I'm, sign. I'm just saying you have some function that yeah. depends on two things because yeah. somehow you're getting the size of the universe involved. Yes. And you also have this new parameter D0, yes. Yes. and you're trying to match dark energy and dark matter. Yes. Right, and one of them sort of clearly related to dark energy, the size of the universe. Yes. Locally for this so you're lucky, you, so, 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 yeah, so it's one, so. You're you, fitting two things for two things. No, 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 no. You're fitting, you're fitting, you can choose your D2 to say, okay, if we, if we think that the cosmological constant is a typical cosmological constant, then we can fix D2, the, the variance, to get a typical cosmological constant. Okay, let me ask my question a different way. This R max, yes. right, why do you think that's related to the size of the observable universe rather than, the universe is probably much larger than our yes. observable yes. match, right? So yes. let's say it's really, I don't know, it's a sphere a million times the size mm -hmm. of the observable universe, seems plausible. Um, then we should be dividing by that R instead, or somehow that doesn't matter because, like, well, like I feel like it's the, the, the relative. It's the it, so there's an overall volume that I think doesn't matter, and I think I agree with you with the overall volume. When you're comparing these two different fluctuations, then I think that is roughly the scale of the fluctuations. Now, I, I, I'm not like, uh, you know, I think I think there is. You know, there is a question about how the how this path integral works because you're approximating the path integral quite you know for, like it w quite crudely, so that is why we do th two different checks to see. So I agree with you that it's a lot like. But both of them are giving an R max that you've summed. No, no, the other one does. The other one is a local one. The other one is just a so local. What, what formula do you get for gamma one and gamma two in that case? No, that <laughs> in that one you see an acceleration scale. And how, how is that acceleration scale related to? Uh, so uh, if you okay, good. So if you. So the issue is that you're you know you're doing a kind of a crude estimate of a global metric like the Schwarzschild metric, which is spherically <laughs> symmetric, and you don't quite know what the dynamics of this thing is. So you get a particular answer. So if you look at the isotropic metric. Then you get something like this. Uh, this is, you know, you see something which is like this: nabba squared phi minus four pi. Um, and roughly minus nabba phi squared c squared all squared. So this thing outside of the path angle, roughly speaking, is satisfied on expectation. So I see that on expectation, I have Poisson's equation, but I also have this additional, this variance of the acceleration squared. Just, can you give me the scale? Where is the scale? This has some scale, right? This like galactic scale or something. No, this is a local equation. But so that's what I'm saying, like you have this one current, and you don't quite know an because you're- acceleration scale. What sorry? is that? You said you're getting some scale that, for the acceleration that matters. What is that scale in terms of the fundamental parameters? Well, that I, that I can't tell you. I just, what I'm telling you is that when the variance of the acceleration is much larger than the acceleration, then this term begins to dominate in a way that you get a, a deviation from Einstein's equation. That's all I'm saying.
So, you're so, saying, so, so, it, so it, it provides a very... Sorry? I'm, I'm trying to understand. You're claiming to explain both dark matter and dark energy. No. Right? I'm <laughs> you're claiming... Yeah, the impression I get is you're wanting to say that there is... Right. You're fitting more things with fewer parameters, right? That, if I have as many right. parameters as I'm fitting right. things, then, that's right. then fine. Right. I'm wanting just, just at a numerology level, just give me some formulas where it's like we have the same formula for these two different things and it right. works in terms of your fundamental... Well, so, this, so I gave you this one where you see that if you fix D2, so there you have a it choice of... Our max. So Sorry? it involved our max, which you were saying was the Hubble scale, even though it didn't seem physically relevant, and you had to well, the scale of the fluctuation. I mean, it's the same reason yeah. why, if you compare it to the uh, to the Brownian particle, you know, it's the, you know, you, you, you basically are fixing a boundary point and integrating out for all time to the time where you're fixing the boundary point. So I think it's the same thing as the Brownian particle. I don't think it's any different. You're saying because it's the age of the universe and its fluctuations have been just growing linearly since then or something? I still don't. I just want to know how this R gets involved. I can believe it does. Which one? Sorry. Just how is how is the size of the universe getting involved right. in any way? Like I, I, that's what I'm really trying to understand. Well, I guess if you imagine a power, I guess you know, you, you're doing a power series in say, uh, like why are these why why does why are these the MPP? Like, why? Like, why are these the most probable paths? I don't know. Like, this is, you know, what you get from the equation. Like, it, it singles out these particular Somewhere in the things. Somewhere equation, you're putting in an R. Sorry. Somewhere in the equation, R max is getting involved. Right. And I don't understand how. Well, the same way how that T max, the same way that T max is is, go, is there for the Brownian motion, right? T can get involved. Guys, you, you should go I find a board yeah. somewhere outside. <laughs> Thank you. Because I, don't, I can't follow anymore, so like, okay. go find a board. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you for <laughs>